My name is Bill Ayres. I'm a Microsoft Certified Master. There are about 200 of, uh, 200 of us around the world. Uh, quite a large proportion of us are here at this conference, which is, which is great. Unfortunately, there won't be any more. So at this point, we're, we're sort of the, uh, not so much the Jedi Knights as the Sith of SharePoint. But anyway, um, there are, I also have a bunch of these other qualifications that you can also get. And um, my background, I started off doing engineering software or uh, in research and, and applying computers to solving engineering problems. So my background is engineering. But somehow, at some point, I ended up being a consultant in SharePoint development and architecture, uh, software architecture, particularly around collaboration sites and web content management. And I also do a little bit of mobile development as well. So that's my background. Uh, you can, I've got a blog site of sorts at uh, that, that address there where I put things as I think of them and I, uh, for my own aid memoir, really, primarily, it's slightly embarrassing when you do a Google search for something and you find yourself back at your own blog because you've forgotten what the solution was that you had. Anyway, you can also follow me on Twitter and by all means email me afterwards if you've got any questions that, where you want to follow up. So I'm going to talk at a fairly high level. It's going to be a bit of an overview session uh, to help you make some choices, technology choices, about where you're going to run code, uh, what kind of languages you're going to use, what frameworks to use, and so on, and how we can use those to break free from uh, that sort of server-side model that we've used in the past. And, and we'll see where, in some cases, that server-side model is still, still valid. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the SharePoint development backstory. Uh, we'll look at client-side development, why we'd want to do that. Uh, we'll talk about different types of SharePoint solutions and SharePoint apps in particular, but also the broader range of solutions we can use uh, using this kind of technique. Uh, and then we'll look at REST and CSOM and the Office, new Office 365 APIs and see where each of those help us out. And then we'll talk a little bit about JavaScript, which you know, was a little bit of a joke to us in the past, and now we're having to take it all terribly seriously. And then we'll wrap up with some conclusions. So at this point in talks, it's traditional to do the hand-waving thing, and everybody says what, at which stage they started using SharePoint. And uh, I think perhaps on a Tuesday morning, I can probably get away with it. Probably by tomorrow afternoon, you'll be sick of waving your hands, but if we could just do this, and I'm not expecting too many, who did SharePoint development in 2010? So occasionally, yeah, we get one or two people who, oh, there are a lot of hands going up, who did uh, SharePoint, sorry, I, did I say 2010? 2001, I meant to say, yes, SharePoint Portal Server 2001. Uh, so it wasn't a great development platform, was it really? And even when we went to SharePoint Portal Server 2003, if we can, maybe a few more hands will go up. I notice I haven't put my hand up yet. Um, that uh, it wasn't really aligned with ASP.NET and the latest technology. It was using classic ASP. Uh, there was a very complex story around delivering solutions, so you had to watch 10 hours of videos by Ted Patterson at slow motion speed in order to work out how to do that. So it was quite difficult. Now, I didn't really use, I used SharePoint 2003, I didn't really use it as a development platform. It was more when it came to 2007 that it became a serious thing that we could, we could build solutions on. Now, it was great. We could uh, do a lot of things. We could build things like web paths, and, and that, you know, that was a, a model that found its way back into ASP.NET as well, uh, that found its way from SharePoint back into the, so the main server development platform. And we could use that to build web parts, which we could then, as a developer, you know, I could give a web part to perhaps a power user, and they could compose apps, applications out of, out of that. And it was a really great building block way of building websites and using web technology. And at that time, that was, was really the state of the art, and it was superb. Now, there were some downsides as well. And one of them was that a lot of developers would come into SharePoint development and they wouldn't really understand the SharePoint platform and so they'd maybe do things the wrong way, uh, be quite to use a lot of uh, unnecessary resources. And a particular problem was uh, memory and resource leaks because 
It was managed code, but underneath those, that thin managed wrapper were quite large COM objects, and they could be multi-megabyte objects. And if you had a, a, a loop running, you might create a lot of SP sites and SP webs, and it would build up, a, a, use a lot of server resources. And you'd think, well, eventually the garbage collector will come along and sort it all out, but usually not before it had brought the server down. And so we got a bit of a bad reputation for SharePoint. I think even SharePoint as a whole, with a few bad implementations of it and, and uh, some problematic server side uh, uh, custom code, resulted in some users finding SharePoint was slow and it was unsatisfactory. You got a bit of a bad name and to the point where you know, there are some end users, you know, there isn't really that much benefit in the SharePoint brand when we talk to end users because they might have had a bad experience at some point in the past. Now, Microsoft has recognized this being a problem and they've tried to solve it over the years. And in SharePoint 2010, I should have put my hand up for 2007, shouldn't I? <laughs> quite a few hands, quite a few people actually stuck on SharePoint 2007 because those customizations have made it difficult to migrate to a later version. So SharePoint 2010, I would expect quite a lot of pe people to be putting their hands up at that point. Um, so in SharePoint 2010, they've brought in sandbox solutions. On the face of it, a great idea. We'll take your DLL, we'll put it in the content database, and then at runtime, we'll, we'll take it out, we'll reflect on it, see what you've got in there, put it into a, uh, an isolated process to run. We'll give you a limited API that you can use to, to talk to SharePoint. Now, you know, over the years, as you do a lot of software development, you find certain patterns emerge, and one is the sort of the limited API model, which we had, like, for example, the compact framework for .NET. And it always happens that the limited API limits you to the, from doing the things you want. You can get so far, and then you hit the limit on the API. And that kind of happened with sandbox solutions, so that wasn't a huge success. So we then moved on to SharePoint 2013. <laughs> And at that point, they said, well, I guess they thought, well, if you don't like running code in this limited API, how about you don't run it on the server at all? And so we had SharePoint apps. And this was the, the model of moving all our code away from the server and running it in some kind of client-side technology or on some remote server using some other technology. Now, next week, there's a conference called Build. And I'm sure there'll be some announcements around 20, SharePoint 2016. You might be wondering, well, are they going about to announce a completely new model again for development? I think probably not. I think we'll probably see a further refinement of, of this kind of approach, of the SharePoint apps approach and all those client-side technologies, and we'll see those develop. And I'm sure we'll see some of the things that we're already seeing in Office 365 start to appear in SharePoint 2016 with the on-premise version. So what's the motivation behind all this? Well, for us, certainly we want to have the rich behavior in our solutions. You know, users now expect this sort of web 2.0 experience, whatever that means. It probably means gray, big gray buttons and a lot of white space in a concertina. But there's more to it than that. There's a, a degree of behavior that an application-like behavior in a web page that people expect and they want the, all these things to work without having to do page turns and go back to the server. And this is a sort of a driving force is what users expect and it's driven also by what people are, are developing in terms of websites using other technologies than, than SharePoint. And also, increasingly, our users are on mobile devices. So workers, information workers, used to all sit at a desk, they'd have a, a PC. Now a lot of them have got mobile devices. In fact, there's some research being done that say we've now reached the point where, as far as websites are concerned, people are hitting the websites with mobile devices rather than desktop devices. The majority are mobile. So we have to take that into account and we have to move forward and, and follow these technology changes. Now, from Microsoft's perspective, there's maybe even more compelling reason, which is 
all these bits of custom code were responsible for a lot of their support issues in SharePoint. And it was also preventing, pre preventing customers from migrating onto the next version of SharePoint. You know, well, Microsoft's a commercial business. They want to sell licenses. You can't sell licenses if people can't move to the next version. But what Microsoft would more, like you to do more than anything, apart, uh, rather than just buy the next version, they'd like you to move to Office 365. And there's no way that Office 365 can support uh, custom server-side development solutions. So that is why we need to, to move, all, move these in, into the client side or onto some other uh, solution if we want to move to Office 365. And of course, there's also a, a desire to make it accessible as a platform to web developers more generally, the wider world of, world of web developers. And I think that's maybe for us, because we're in a, a uh, on-premise SharePoint development track here, you know, I think it's slightly the elephant in the room in that uh, we may be a little bit nervous that if lots of web developers move into our space, then that will, uh, that will affect us. Now, from, from Microsoft's point of view and from, from project manager's point of view, that's a good thing. They want lots of people. You know, it suits me if the SharePoint developers are in short supply, obviously, as a, as a consultant. Uh, but, you know, you'll see things like this on MSDN. Well, they'll say, oh, you can use your favorite web development tools. They're not really talking to us as SharePoint developers. And so that makes some of us a little bit nervous that people are going to come in and, and invade our space. Now, I think that's unlikely, really, in, in a sense, because what we know as SharePoint developers, our skill set is really much deeper than that. It, we, we know how SharePoint works, and it doesn't really matter too much whether we're doing server-side code or we're using JavaScript. You know, it's our knowledge of the SharePoint platform that's important. But I do think it's absolutely vitally important that we we take on board these client-side skills and we understand JavaScript and HTML5 and CSS and all these other skills. We need to get up to speed with it. There may be things that we would have before given to a front-end developer. We now need to learn some of these, these, these skills and, and get up to speed on them and get on board. So I've got a little video. Um, SharePoint apps, this word app, what does it mean? I discovered that the speech processing engine in this, uh, this program doesn't actually know what, how to pronounce app. So the panda, which is the management panda, doesn't know how to say app. He says ape. So uh, I thought that kind of fitted the, 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 the character. Hi, I am your chief executive. I need your help to install our executive information ape on my new iPhone. It's not an ape. It's called an app. But the SharePoint, I mean the executive information app only supports Windows Phone, which is our corporate standard mobile device. Yes, but I have a new iPhone. And I am the chief executive in charge of everything. The iPhone is not on the list of devices approved by the IT department. Yes, but I have an iPhone and I need to use our executive information aid so I can update our corporate mission statement and other important things you wouldn't understand. You shouldn't be connecting your non-standard device to the corporate network. It was agreed that only Windows Phone devices could be used. That was last year, before I got my new iPhone. Why did you buy an iPhone? Because it is cool. And it is white. All my golf buddies have white iPhones. You could have a Windows phone in addition to your iPhone. No, the approved Windows phones are all black. I can't be seen with a black phone. You could browse to the SharePoint site and get to the executive information portal that way. No, it needs to be an ape. Why? Because apes are cool. It will cost a lot of money to build an app for the iPhone. That's okay. Getting the executive information aid working on my phone is mission critical. So what are apps? Not apes, they're apps. You know, what, um, I don't understand fashion. You know, it, it becomes cool. People talk about apps. And you might have thought, well, maybe just it's the latest fad. But I think 
the, the word apps, users do understand that apps are different to what we used to call applications that we'd install on our computer. So on a desktop, you'd, you'd go and you'd, um, you'd install some executable file which you got from somewhere, and you'd be slightly worried that it might slow your computer down and possibly be almost impossible to uninstall afterwards. And so we then have to get antivirus software, which would slow our computer down and be impossible to uninstall afterwards. And so the, when people have their mobile phones, it's, a, it's their own personal space. They really you know, want something that's safe, and they want to know that there's some sort of vetting that, that's gone on and that the, there's a marketplace to distribute them. They're easy to get. They're sandbox. They're not going to do something nasty to their computer, to their device, and they're uh, going to uninstall cleanly and leave nothing behind. And SharePoint apps also deliver on that kind of promise. You know, there's a, a distribution channel with a, a, the office store has a SharePoint section in it. There's also a way you can deliver them to your end users within the organization using an app catalog. So there's a way of getting things to users. They can install them safely and so on, and they'll, they can be removed safely. In a few slides, we'll see how that's, that's achieved. And I think increasingly, we've got to start thinking about our SharePoint solutions as, as not so much that, uh, that, it's, uh, that SharePoint is, is really a, one of many services that we're consuming. We're perhaps mashing up together a solution based on many services that we're going to consume. And so rather than being a platform that we're building on, it's just one of many services. And we can maybe think of SharePoint as a, as a service using this devices and services model, where those devices are going to be increasingly mobile devices and our applications will be installed on the mobile device and talk to all these services. That's the long-term view, and I think that's, you know, that's where we need to be heading in the future. Now, that gives us a problem about where our code is going to run. I'm not doing this video, but, but we've got this, uh, you know, it's a source of some angst in the development community about where are, where are we going to run our code, and, and you know, we kind of feel as though we're banished from the SharePoint server. So traditionally, we've had server-side object model, we've built things on the server, we've then rendered them in a web page, and then increasingly, and this has been going on for a number of years now, way before SharePoint apps came along, we've had JavaScript, in, on the, in the website, in the page, to augment the experience of the user. So we might have had, um, for example, a concertina written in JavaScript by a front-end developer, but we might also have implemented a custom web service inside our SharePoint server to do something more sophisticated to support a data table, so things rendering in the client using AJAX. We might have used some of the existing endpoints such as this data service, the REST endpoint, or the CSOM in SharePoint 2010 in its first iteration. Or we might have used Mark Anderson's SP Services JavaScript library in order to augment the experience of the user so that we've got code, in a sense, running both client and server. And that's a, a good model. And we could choose whether we want code to run on the client or the server depending on what we were trying to achieve. Now, if you're going to tell us it's a better idea not to run any, anything on the server, then we've got a problem of where, where we're going to run things if we want to do something like have an event receiver or we want to have a, a timer job. Where, where's that going to, going to run? So then we have to have the proxy server. So this is the other, other model in the app model comes into play where we have some sort of proxy server that's going to make the calls to SharePoint and, we'll, and that will deliver the pages, and then that proxy server will talk to, to the SharePoint server. And then as we broaden our horizons even more and we start having devices, well, we start having to have rich clients, and those rich clients might talk directly to SharePoint server, or they might also talk through a proxy server. And that's actually been the model that we've tended to use so far if we want to write a mobile app, for example, that talks to the SharePoint API, simply because we don't really have in the, SharePoint, uh, in the uh, REST services that SharePoint supply and the, and the, and the 
CSOM. We don't really have a good way of storing client credentials in a safe way on the client. Now we'll see how that is changing and there are better solutions coming along so that we can now have rich clients that just talk directly to the SharePoint server in the same way as it would talk to any other service. And we can use any technology on these, uh, either on the rich client or the proxy server, and we might choose JavaScript. That's an option, so the, the client device, a, a mobile phone, we might use uh, HTML5 hybrid apps there, so we could be running JavaScript on the client, we might be running JavaScript on the server because we could be using Node.js. So we could actually end up in a situation where everything we're running is using JavaScript, which is quite interesting given that we thought JavaScript was a bit of a joke 10 years ago and we didn't take it very seriously and now, now it looks as though it could be the, the tool that we could use across all these different, uh, different places. So interesting that, that JavaScript is starting to be a, a key technology that we need to learn. Now there are a couple of types of SharePoint apps. So the the SharePoint hosted app is the one that represents the, where we're talking direct to the server. Then the, the proxy server approach is the cloud hosted app. Slightly unfortunate names because the code isn't really running in SharePoint. It's kind of running in the client, isn't it? It's in, in, in the browser, in JavaScript, in the hosted app. It's, it's, the cloud hosted app could be an on-premise server as well. It isn't necessarily out in the cloud but it's the idea that the, the code's running on, on there. So the, the model for the SharePoint hosted apps is pretty simple, pretty robust. We just have code running in the client that talks through this app web. So when we provision a SharePoint hosted app, we create an app web. Now there's a slight complication in that for security reasons, we run that in a separate domain, DNS domain. So there's a bit of work that you need to do to set that. Even if you've got a development box, you're going to have to do a little bit of work to set up a working environment. And there's some links there that will uh, remind you how to do that. But you've got to go into DNS and, and, and then tell SharePoint in, the, in central administration, how, how am I going to get to, to this, uh, where am I going to put this app web? And then the app web is where you're going to run your, your app. Uh, so you've then got a little bit of a problem with a cross-domain issue because browsers have a mechanism against cross-site scripting. So if I render a page in this URL, I can't just willy-nilly go to some other URL and start bringing, uh, bringing content back. So there's a, a few tricks that we need to do in order to do uh, cross-domain calls. And in fact, the app web supplies us with a special endpoint that we can use in order to call through to the host web. And that kind of isolates the app web from the host web. And the idea is when we take the app web away, then there's nothing left behind. Now, some developers obviously will find ways of getting around that and provision things in the host web, which you know, then leaves you with a problem where it's not no longer completely cleanly installing. But overall, this is a, a, very, uh, a very straightforward model. It's, it works very well. When you come to the cloud-hosted app approach, it gets a little bit more complicated because we're now going to talk to this remote web, which we're going to provision using whichever server technology we want to. So it might be uh, ASP.NET MVC, but it could also be Ruby on Rails. You know, it depends you know, what technology the developer wants to use. And this is one of the attractions, I think, that, that, that's been promoted is that it allows developers using other technologies to get into SharePoint development which it does, but there are, it's quite a complicated thing to set up. So I think one of the problems here is that you've kind of got two servers now that you have to maintain. So you know, we've, got our, we've worked out how to make our SharePoint server resilient and, and performant and, and reliable, and now we've got to do the same thing for this other web server using whatever technology we've chosen for that. And then there's a number of issues of of trust and, and how we communicate between this web server and, and SharePoint. And quite a lot of people have found that quite tricky to set up. There may, for example, be a firewall that's between those two servers, which makes life difficult. There is a way around it because the browser, you can see both the remote web and the host web, and so you can use the browser to make the request on behalf of the remote web back in through the 
the app web, which you'll then have to precision, provision, and then, then it looks a bit more like the SharePoint hosted app and, and go through there. But now you've got two cross-domain calls to do. So you end up with quite a complicated sort of double hop cross-domain problem to solve in order to get, because your browser is rendering a page in the remote web, which is different from the app web, which itself is different from the host web. And so it starts to get quite complicated. And a lot of people have found this quite challenging to get this working. And whereas they've been very successful with the, host web, uh, the SharePoint hosted solution, they find it a little more difficult to get this working. So you've got to take a view as to whether that, the, the cost of doing that is, is worth it or whether I can just somehow continue using the server-side object model. And you know, that, I, th I think the point there is that that is still a valid model. You, know, you, you, can, you can use that. It's, it's your decision what technology you use. And, and you know, as long as you're aware of the limitations, I can't then move it to Office 365. Uh, you might take a view that I'm going to continue using the server-side object model for the things that I need to do those sort of server-side type things. Now, we've got a few arrows joining these various things. And, uh, you know, what, how, how are we going to make those communication channels work? What, what technologies have we got available? And again, we've got quite a few. And so the number of technology choices starts to multiply fairly quick, quickly. So the managed CSOM is something that Ted Patterson was talking about yesterday. And if you didn't go to his session, you should definitely uh, view that on the DVD when it comes. But this, uh, this will... It's something you can use from C Sharp or JavaScript, actually, and it'll talk through to this endpoint, which is called client. It's actually VTI bin client.service, but there's a, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter because you've got a nice API to use. Now, I think the intention here was when they introduced the client-side object model is that they were hoping that it would be familiar to server-side object model developers and, and trying to make it as similar as possible. And so you've, you know, there's some consistency in the way that we do things using server-side code. Uh, you probably, I mean, these are very trivial examples. You'd probably want to do some sort of asynchronous call here, async await or something in your C sharp code. You can also use that from JavaScript. Uh, in that case, you know that we have to do everything in a jar JavaScript style. So. Uh, JavaScript's more of a functional language, so we tend to use callback functions and we indent the things a different way. Uh, I think a lot of developers who are maybe familiar with C Sharp uh, mistakenly think, well, because the syntax doesn't look that different in JavaScript, it's kind of the same language, but it's not. You know, it's fundamentally different approach in a lot of the ways that JavaScript works. It's not a, a classical language, it's a, a prototypal language and so on. So, you have to think a little bit differently, but at a first blush, it looks as though they're very similar, and, and yet they're kind of fundamentally different. Now, that's CSOM and the JavaScript object model, which is sometimes called JSOM, confusingly, JSOM, which returns JSON. Uh, there's another approach, which is the, to use REST. Now, REST is a backronym for reinvented, uh, uh, reinvented existing server technology. I think I worked out it must mean. It doesn't. It means representational state transfer. But it's really a, a rediscovery of how HTTP was always meant to work in the first place. You know, for about a decade, we only used GET and POST uh, HTTP methods. Uh, but there's always been quite a number of there's six or seven verbs available in the HTTP protocol. And so a lot of people thought, well, as SOAP became bloated and, and more complicated, uh, these uh, payloads where you're putting everything in an XML payload in your request, it became quite complicated and people were looking for a, a simpler way of doing it. So REST is great because it's uh, kind of, an, uh, these are all open standards. And also, there's a standard called OData, which is how we form the, the requests and how we can do filters and things in, in the query string of the request. And then it returns JSON, and there's some rules about how the JSON uh, JavaScript object notation uh, is, is re uh, returned. So that's a, that's a very nice uh, approach to use because it means that, we, that the requests we're making to SharePoint are, are going to be consistent with how we're using these other services that we might be using, because it's an open standard. 
And uh, there's a, an example here of using REST with jQuery, a very widely used uh, JavaScript uh, library. So the dollar is actually maps to jQuery. It might be safer to use jQuery than dollar, just in case somebody rewrites the meaning of the dollar symbol. But uh, there's a method that jQuery has got, which is called Ajax, which uh, you can make a request. Now, it's a, it's a bit of bad luck, really, that at about the time that SharePoint uh, 2013 was released and this REST API was included, um, the OData standard got uh, revved, and so uh, we went from OData 2 to OData 3, and the consequence of that was really for compatibility, they were forced to make you... This, this uh, doesn't seem to do a lot. I think I'm low on battery. Okay, I shall point. They were, we were forced to use OData equals verbose to tell uh, SharePoint that, that we're using the OData 2 standard. And uh, they correctly implemented it so it wouldn't respond if you didn't put OData verbose. And it, and it either gives an error message uh, or it possibly gives you some XML back instead of JSON. So that meant that all these uh, various samples that were in the beta release <laughs> uh, didn't work anymore because the standard out of the box sort of uh, jQuery get JSON method doesn't give you an option to change the accept headers on your HTTP request. So those stopped working. Now, the good news is in Office 365, OData 3 and JSON Lite, which is the, uh, also a more efficient way of returning the, uh, the response from, JSON, uh, from, from REST, uh, is now working in o Office 365. That's been implemented. And it's also been implemented in Service Pack 1 of SharePoint 2013. Now, I think that's quite interesting because it's one of the cases where a feature that's been in Office 365 has found its way now back into the, uh, the uh, on-premise version of SharePoint. Uh, the, at, at, up to a certain point, it always seemed to be that the Office 365 was behind the on-premise version, then Office 365 overtook, and now the things are finding their way back into the on-premise version. So maybe we'll see more of that in SharePoint 2016 when it uh, comes out and we learn a bit more about it next week. But, uh, the, unfortunately, the, there's a few config changes. You need to make some changes to the web config. So bef just to be aware, if you just Google for that phrase there, and about the third item down is my blog post about, uh, about how, you, how you need to configure the web config in order to enable in. So you need SharePoint 2013 and Service Pack 1, and then you get OData 3. So moving forward, staying up with the standards, which is all good. Now, the REST endpoints don't completely cover the, all of the coverage of the CSOM API at this point. I hope that they will increase the coverage over time. So there's still a few things where you'd want to use CSOM rather than REST. But also, the REST endpoints are pretty consistent, except for one, one uh, project team. If you can guess which one didn't quite get the memo to get the same API, never mind. So what I'll do is I'll just... Uh, do a little mini demo here of using the REST API and the various different APIs. So I've got a, uh, a site here. It's nothing very exciting. It's just a site and it's got a title development and that's what we're going to use to, to retrieve. And I've got a... Uh, a project here which I've built where, uh, or rather a solution that's got a number of projects. And the first one we'll look at is this CSOM console app. So very simple, it's uh, this file here, program.cs. And what we've done is we've built a console app and we get our client context using the client side object model. And you'll notice that this is running on my laptop and my uh, VMs here, I'll just show you. I've got this, this server, LitVS13, running in a VM. So I'm actually doing all my development on the laptop, you know, on the, uh, on the client, which is nice. So I don't have to worry about doing, uh, running on the server that's running SharePoint, which is a big step forward. And then we, we go through this. We, uh, I've done a bit of jiggery-pokery here to set an authentication mode to anonymous because I don't want to spend time 
going through authentication and authorization issues, but uh, there's my password anyway. I thought I just, you know, I like to keep that out in the open. And uh, we execute a query, and we then can work with that object that we've returned. So under the hood, it's going to make a request, and, and, and then we can display the title. So if I run it, it probably won't work, will it? Because it's a demo. But, so if I run that, and it, it runs that console app and returns the site title. Now, what I can do is, and it's a good exercise, is to run Fiddler when you're doing this kind of thing and see, see what's happening, have a look under the kimono to see what it's actually doing. Uh, so if I go to, back to that application and, and run it, that console app again, run it again, debug, start new instance, and uh, that's, that's that run. And then I go to Fiddler, I can start to examine what it's done. So it's gone to, here's the endpoint it's gone to. So it's VTI bin, good old Vermeer Technologies, sites as an X. Uh, and that, if we inspect it, you can see that we've actually got a... Um, it's actually made a SOAP request initially uh, in order to get some context, which then comes back... Uh, we'll do a text view of that. So we get a, and a SOAP body comes back. And then the next request it does is to VTI bin client.service, which is incidentally the same endpoint that the underscore API goes to and which also the REST API is, is, comes from as well. And, but then it calls this method process query, uh, and then I need to decode that. And then the response comes back, interestingly enough, in JSON. So this is JavaScript object notation. So Rather than angle brackets, we've got square brackets and curly brackets, very similar to the Java um, object serialization uh, format as well. So it's simpler, uh, and it's very easy to use from Java because you can just rehydrate these objects into... From JavaScript, I beg your pardon, we can rehydrate those objects. If we go over to uh, another sample I've got here, which is... I uh, had, uh, had to build this out as a... a um, a JavaScript Windows 8, Windows 8.1 project. Uh, so it's using a WinJS library, and that's uh, this one. And I'm doing much the same thing, but of course now I'm using JavaScript. So I, I make that uh, request again. And if we run this one, not the right one, and now it's running as a you know, big Windows uh, Metro style app. And I still get the title of the, So that's development has come back from the server. I do close this down the cool way. And uh, I need to stop that. And meanwhile, Fiddle has still been running. So you can see that the only difference is this process query request is exactly the same as what we had in the uh, CSOM, but the that request is slightly different. That's gone to the newer endpoint, which is context info that you sometimes use to get the, the, uh, the context. Right, so my th I'm just aware of it. I don't want to spend too long on this, but uh, I've just also got one here that uses REST. So we we'll just look at the code behind that, and that's the, this one. So now what we're doing is we're, we're calling into... Was that, that was the JSON one, that's JSON, JavaScript object model, and this is REST, so I've got an AJAX call, and I've put a couple of AJAX calls in. I've put the first one is using OData verbose, and the second one I've deliberately not done OData verbose, and it'll just, just to note what, what it returns if you don't do that configuration thing I, I talked about before. And we'll run this one. And that, that should work in the same way. So it still returned the site title, but that second one where I use the JSON light, it doesn't, uh, it, it actually fails. And what it does is it returns some XML. So I'll close this one down. And we can also go over to here and we can see that the, uh, the request is very simple. So this is the one that worked. And there's nothing here. And there's no body at all in the request. There's just a header uh, well, it's just the get, which is a get API web title, and then the response is this tiny bit of, of JSON that comes back. 
The second one fails because it, I haven't done that web config thing, so just, just be aware of that. And when I'm ready to, uh, to build that as a SharePoint hosted app, I, it's very easy. I, you know, the, the, I've still got a, uh, I can just go into the project and do a project new and, and create a SharePoint app. And um, the, actually, the code for that, just out of interest, is, um, is slightly different in that I have to then, if I can just find it, scripts, uh, app.js. I have to deal with this URL that goes up to the, comp to, the, to the app web and then goes up to the host web using this app context site endpoint. And that's, uh, that's like a, a sort of a router that takes you up to the host web. And then that, they can do the same thing there. But that's because in the, in the browser, when I'm running in the browser, I can't do a cross-site call. But if I'm writing a client app, I can, because I, it's, it's only the browser that imposes those cross-site limitations. OK, so that's all uh, very, very interesting. Now, this whole world just got a lot better for us because there's something new that's come along called the Office 365 API. Um, there's going to be a talk tomorrow by Chris O'Brien where he's going to go into detail in the Office 365 API, so you probably want to, want to go to that. But I'll just cover it very briefly here because I think it's very significant that the Office 365 API, so obviously it's only at the moment available in Office 365. You know, one would hope it might become available at some point for on-premise development as well, but it's still significant because we might have a hybrid scenario. So we might, uh, we might be doing some things to Office 365 and some things to our on-server, uh, uh, our uh, uh, on-premise servers. So the Office 365 API is built on top of REST. So you remember how the CSOM was a, uh, a C-sharp API, but it wasn't making REST calls underneath. This does. So it, there's a REST API, and then built on top of that, there are some .NET and JavaScript wrappers. In fact, there are some libraries also for iOS and Android. So, but the underlying thing is REST, so you can combine the two approaches, and you can use your, just use REST directly, or you can make use of these convenient uh, APIs that have been wrapped around it. And they do a lot of the things like uh, uh, deal with some of the authentication issues. There's a nice library for it called Adel.js, which gives you libraries that help you with that whole authentication story, which becomes quite complicated in, in, these, uh, in these situations. And we've got uh, tools. Uh, so that in Visual Studio, you can, you can say new project, and then on, uh, you right-click, and, and it'll say add connection. And they will go off, and they'll register your application for you and sort of co-gen these APIs, these uh, helper libraries, and put them into your project. So you can get up and running very quickly using Visual Studio. And they don't just talk, they talk to SharePoint sites, so that's part of it, but they're also talking to email and calendar and your tasks list and so on in Office 365. So now we have an opportunity to build solutions that aren't just for SharePoint, but use all these other features in Office 365, and we can build out quite sophisticated solutions. So I think that's rather exciting. It's not a replacement for the client-side object model or the SharePoint REST API. Uh, there's not full coverage of that. At the moment, it's just some specific things around sites, around the sites API. Uh, but it's, you know, it's augmented. And the nice thing is that the tokens that you get back, the uh, authentication tokens that you get back from this route, from, so this is really talking about uh, Adel.js and, and Azure and Adel, the, these libraries. So the uh, Adel is uh, Azure uh, Active Directory Authentication Library, yeah, yet another four-letter acronym. Uh, that allows you to get a token which you can use against the SharePoint API. So 
this is, this is really a new way of doing authentication. Before, we used to use uh, access control services, which is what the SharePoint APIs are built on top of. But this is, this is a better way of, of doing it. This gives us things like we've got a, the option of an, a, a different authentication flow called implicit grant, which means that we can go and get a token, uh, access token straight away without going through this authorization code uh, the two-legged auth dance. And that's a, that's a big advantage because it, it means that we can then safely build client applications that call, talk directly to SharePoint or directly to Office 365 rather than having to go through a proxy server. So that's going to make our lives a lot easier. Uh, and as these technologies are developed, and they're just coming out now, this has just become generally available, but as these continue to get developed, we'll get uh, more and more powerful libraries that can we, we can use and make this whole development story of developing in this way better and better. So these, again, the, the, the library that you get is used in this sort of format, and, and these, some of these uh, methods are generated. They'll, they'll appear in your project when you, when you create one of these, these uh, applications. It'll also do all the stuff in Azure Active Directory for you, which, is, which now has the ability to register apps directly, but it'll, it, the Visual Studio tools will do that for you. And you can also, uh, if you prefer, go into the uh, Azure portal and, and set them up manually as well. You might have to do a bit of that if you want to do something like using the implicit uh, grant authentication flow. My clicker is not clicking anymore. Uh, I was g going to do a, a little bit of a demo of this, but there's going to be a lot of that tomorrow, I think, in Chris O'Brien's section session. But uh, what you should definitely do, it almost don't need to demo it, because you can go to this brilliant thing called the Office 365 API sandbox and experiment for yourselves. It makes it very easy. If you've ever used a tool called uh, um, JS Fiddle, not to be confused with Fiddler, JS Fiddle, uh, a tool that allows you to build things and just test them out using JavaScript and CSS and HTML. Um, this allows you to quickly try things out using their test data if you want to, and then see how it works, and then copy and paste that code into your solutions. Now, we've almost uh, got a, an overwhelming choice of options for development now. And as we drill down into each of these bits of technology, that starts to fan out into more and more possibilities. So I found I'm sort of starting to have a, a list of my preferred technologies that I... Uh, uh, my main motivation is to reduce the number of bits of things that I have to learn. So if I can learn JavaScript and use that for lots of different things, that's a win for me because that's one skill I have to learn. So I dream of, of code reuse, but failing that, I'd like to do skills reuse. So. I'm still going to keep doing farm solutions. You know, I think it's still a relevant skill. I don't think you should sort of forget about uh, all your farm development skills. Uh, so I still like doing that. Uh, I, I like the uh, JavaScript REST and SharePoint hosted model. I think that those are all good things that they work very well, and I, I enjoy using those. I've rather fallen in love with this new Office 365 API and the way that that works. I think that's, a, that's a, another big step forward. And I don't think that's a, a replacement for the, uh, the SharePoint app model uh, moving forward. I think that's just an augmentation of it. We're just getting more choices and more things we can do. So we need to skill up, I'm afraid. And if you're not already getting interested in JavaScript, you, know, you probably need to start looking at that more seriously. Now, there's a good session tomorrow, actually, that Hugh Wood is going to do, which is going to be talking about JavaScript and, and using it in um, having major cl clicker problems at the moment. Uh, he's going to be talking about some of the tricks and, and what to look out for in, in adding JavaScript to your solutions. Now, I... <laughs> I've realized, a funny thing, I realized that I've actually been doing JavaScript longer than I've been doing C Sharp. So I've been doing JavaScript one way or another for almost 20 years, maybe not quite, but almost 20 years. Probably for the last eight, for 18 of those years, I was probably doing it really badly. 
And it's one of those things, you know, where you're, uh, when you're 18, you think your father's a fool, and when you're 21, you're surprised how much he's learned in three years. And I feel a, bit, a little bit the same way about JavaScript. The language is, uh, I thought it was a, 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 a badly written, hastily built scripting language that you use in web pages. Um, and then when I looked at, uh, looked at it a bit later, I was surprised how much it had improved over the last few years until I looked at one of my old JavaScript books from 1980, uh, 1997 or whenever it was, and I discovered all those features were there in the language all the time. We just only just discovered them. And it's a bit misleading because it looks like C Sharp, that you, you think it's the same, but it's not. So you need to learn how to use JavaScript properly, uh, need to learn how to use, uh, build enterprise class JavaScript. And a very good book to read about that is uh, Douglas Crockford's uh, JavaScript, the good parts, is a, an excellent starting reference, and it's only about that thin, that thick, which says a lot, really. <laughs> it's, uh, the good parts book is very thin, which, uh, which is a quick read and uh, well worth reading and then rereading and perhaps reading a third time. We've got many frameworks and libraries. You need to learn things like jQuery. You might want to learn a few other utility libraries that can make JavaScript development easier. If you're doing anything at all sophisticated on the client side, you almost, almost certainly will want to use some sort of SPA, single page application model, of which Angular is by far the most popular at the moment. And uh, again, that's something you can catch up with uh, one of the earlier sessions when you get your DVD pack. Uh, you can uh, watch uh, Andrew Connell's session on, on Angular. But these are, you know, there are, there are many JavaScript libraries. Uh, one that I've used is WinJS, which is the one that was used to build the applications for uh, Windows 8, and you can build for Windows 10 as well, the sort of universal apps in, in JavaScript. Um, the nice thing about JavaScript libraries is you can kind of mix and match and use all these things together. So you've got many choices. You, know, you can use Angular and use WinJS and use other libraries as well. You need to learn REST and OData. These are open standards you need to be familiar with. And I'm afraid that whilst we've perhaps allowed our front-end web developers to concentrate on the HTML5 and the CSS3 uh, end of things, it's time that we also become conversant in those skills as SharePoint developers. We need to take those on board and learn about them. The, the front-end development used to be all about fixing little bugs in, in browsers, and uh, now it's, it's something that we need. We, you know, we can build, build our, bring our, our enterprise development skills and, and bring them into the, the client-side development world as well. Now, how would we do something like this if we were doing traditional SharePoint development? You'd probably start with a site. You'd uh, maybe have a, a list for this uh, list of butterflies here. Um, have a SharePoint list and then a list view to render it. We might have devise a web part here to do this butterfly identification control tool thing. This thing here, you might think, OK, it's a view of the uh, list item. And, but if I told you that this is text that's been generated according to what's in the properties of the, of the field, then you might think, OK, well, in that case, I'll use an out-of-the-box web part there, and I'll make a custom web part here, and then I'll have a search site. And that's how we'd do it if we were doing traditional SharePoint development. If you want to move to this new app model, or the, the more client-side way of doing things, the temptation is to start trying to map all these things from the server-side world into the client-side world. So you might start thinking, OK, Instead of a web part, maybe I should use an app part, and, and instead of this, I should use that, and then try to do a mapping. And I think that's a mistake. I think when you start doing client-side development, it's an opportunity to make a, a fresh view and say, OK, how can I implement this using client-side technologies if I just start, start again and take a fresh look at it? And the way I would do this is I'd say, OK, I've only got 200 of these items. I can just go and make a REST call and pull the whole lot back in one go. And you know, it's only going to be a few K over the wire. And then once I've got it on the client side, I can then build a, a SPA application 
So the single page app, which will use the, the, the single page app library, will just sort of flip pages in front of each other, make them visible. It, it look to the user as if they're navigating around an app, and what we're actually doing is making divs visible and invisible and things like that. And we let the framework worry about how to do that. So we learn a SPA framework and deliver it that way. And I think that's a, a better way of doing it. Unless you're doing some sort of migration, obviously you're going to do a sort of a mapping of, of things if you want to migrate an existing solution. But if, you've, if you're building something like this from the start, I would, I would take a fresh look. And you might even decide, whatever it is, that there isn't really a good way of doing it using client-side technology. And you might think, you know, maybe I should look at the business requirement and, and is this the right thing to do or, or shall we change our business requirements or, or review what we want, uh, what our requirements are. Wouldn't it be great if we had one set of technologies and we could deliver to all these different platforms? We could build websites and build for Windows 10 and build for Windows desktop and Android and iOS devices. And we could build things in Office 365 and on the Office client. And I think these technologies allow us to do this. You know, we can build things in Word using exactly the same technologies. So even if we can't reuse code, we can at least reuse skills. And I, I think this is, this is quite exciting to me anyway, is that, that we can reuse a lot of these skills and deliver to all these different things and, and deliver things that our users want. So to sum up, we've got this, the REST API and the Office 365 API, I think, allow us to now sort of move forward and, and, and build really the things that our users want. We can use our existing JavaScript and REST skills, we might have to sort of up our game a bit in those areas and, and, and learn how to use those tools as they were intended to be used. We can add things like Office to our portfolios of the things that we can do and deliver as SharePoint developers. Do visit this, uh, there's the Office 365 dev site, which I think Jeremy mentioned yesterday morning, but that is packed with information uh, about how to build on the, they've really improved that over what was available, say, a year or two ago uh, for, to, to support us as developers. There's great resources out there now that can help us. There's a, some brilliant work that's been done in the patterns and practices, which is all on GitHub. So there are loads and loads of samples for doing this kind of uh, work and using this, these different approaches. And, you know, it's still valid, you know, we can still do server-side development. It's still going to be on-premises server. It's still supported, so, you know, we don't have to just completely abandon everything that we've built in the past. That will continue to be relevant. But these new approaches are what's going to enable us to move forward in the future, and we need to develop our skills in that direction. Otherwise, I fear we will be left behind. So I've been doing development on the Microsoft platform for over two decades now. And it's, to be honest, it's always felt as though there was a little piece of the jigsaw missing or there was uh, things you would maybe to, to a tiny extent you were locked into the technology. You couldn't always do what you wanted to do. It feels as though right now all the planets have come into alignment. And I think it's a very exciting time to be a, a, a developer on the Microsoft platform platform and also as a SharePoint developer. You know, all these individual items, the REST API, the Office 365, JavaScript, all these JavaScript frameworks, individually, they're, they're pretty interesting, but you take them all together and I think it just opens a whole new world for us. So I hope that's been useful and uh, <laughs> I hope we'll all go out and build incredible applications for our end users and I'll leave this uh, resources slide up but that's all I've got to say so thank you very much indeed for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.